I propose we spend some time talking about the threshold issues that have to be decided in how to go about a sovereign debt restructuring. I'm going to try to interlard this discussion with historical examples. So everything that we're about to talk about, of course, has uh, precedence in history, and I'll try to point those out to you when we, when we hit them. I hold this truth to be self-evident, that in the 21st century, no sovereign, whether developing or developed, borrows money with the expectation that it will ever have to repay it. If by repay it, you mean apply current resources to retire the liability. In the 21st century, every sovereign borrows in the sure and certain hope that when the debt matures, they will be able to borrow from someone else to repay that. And when that matures, they'll borrow from someone else to repay that and so on and endlessly so forth in perpetuity. Uh, it is for this reason, this what I call the assumption of refinancing. Um, it is for this reason that sovereign debt stocks tend normally to grow by a process of relentless, remorseless accretion. They very rarely go down. They may go down in debt to GDP terms because GDP will go up, but debts, sovereign debt stocks rarely go down. It was not always this way. Forty years ago, when, as Jerome explained, the principal lenders to emerging markets were commercial banks, uh, no commercial banker would go to his or her credit committee uh, with a proposal to lend to the Republic of Ruritania, knowing that the first question the committee was going to ask is, what makes you think Ruritania will repay this loan? There are a couple of implied predicates in that question. The first is that Ruritania will in fact repay the loan with its own resources. And the second, and it's important, is that the bank would be there uh, on the maturity date and would be holding the liability and therefore would have the risk of repaying. The bankers, no banker in those days would have accepted the risk that on a certain day in the future, Ruritania would be able to borrow at a tolerable interest rate from some other source to repay them. So the banker's response to that in those days uh, could have taken any number of forms. It usually took the form of a so-called amortizing loan. Uh, the, uh, there would be a term loan, let's say for 10 years, but the borrower would be obliged to retire in installments the principal amount of the loan, let's say in the last five years, so that when the final maturity date came, it was a digestible amount of money that had to be repaid. There were other techniques, particularly in the earlier years, so-called sinking funds where uh, the amount of the loan would not actually be retired, but the borrower would be obliged to fund a trustee uh, for amounts which at maturity would be used to apply. No mas amigos. Hmm? In today's world, where sovereigns are borrowing principally from the bond market, the bond market actually likes bullet maturities. That is the repayment of the full amount of the bond on a certain day in the future. Therefore, the bond market, we all, uh, operate these days on the assumption that these debts will be refinanced. By the way, the difference between 40 years ago and today reflects the depth and liquidity of the capital markets and what has happened over those 40 years. It is now perfectly plausible for people to say, uh, uh, Ruritania will have access to some capital market, because the capital markets are vastly bigger than they were. 40 years ago, if you went to a minister of finance and said, you're going to borrow money, 
it meant you're going to borrow, in foreign currency, you're, it probably meant you're going to borrow US dollars through a syndicated LIBOR-based loan agreement. Today, you can borrow in any currency and swap it into the currency you want. You can borrow fixed and swap it into floating. Uh, the capital markets are just vastly larger. The problem, of course, is that the refinancing assumption occasionally proves to be fragile. Uh, sometimes it is the country's own economic mismanagement that causes the markets to turn skittish, to turn arthritic. But sometimes it causes quite outside the uh, ability of the sovereign debtor itself to affect. So you can have an unexpected geopolitical crisis. Uh, you can have a Lehman moment. You can have interest rates in the developed world begin to rise. This was 1994. Uh, the Fed raised interest rates 11 times in that year, causing money to come surging out of emerging markets uh, back into what investors saw was now a remunerative investment in a safer asset, uh, which was one of the causes of the tequila crisis in, in Mexico in December of, of 1994. It can be the misfortune or the malfeasance of a sovereign someplace else in the world that reminds investors that there are risks in sovereign lending and all of a sudden they begin to pull back. The fragility that we as a community have allowed to uh, 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 infect the financial markets, the sovereign financial markets, is that we now have a financial system uh, that is predicated on a belief in the perpetual benignity of the political world, of the financial world, even of the natural world. Uh, but, but the problem is when a country, uh, uh, for whatever reason, uh, finds that it cannot refinance its maturing debt, which is the ex accepted assumption these days, at that point the choices become quite grisly. Um, one option is to attempt to use the English English phrase to brass it out, that is to, uh, to get through a period of market interruption by using one's reserves. Uh, that is almost always a remarkably bad idea. Uh, for one thing, the reserves of most countries will last only a matter of weeks or months. Uh, a pal of mine did a little study of this a couple of years ago. He concluded that uh, were the United States, uh, the world's largest sovereign debtor, to be cut off entirely from any credit market, uh, it would last about 17 weeks in servicing its debt and covering its budget deficits from its reserves. That prediction turned out to be almost exactly right uh, when a few years ago, you remember, uh, the US Congress balked at increasing the borrowing ceiling for the US government and the Secretary of the Treasury had to write to uh, Congress and say we last about three months, a little more than three months before we run out of money and at that point would have had to uh, not pay someone uh, and they never specified who they might not pay uh, in that circumstance. The second option, uh, if you have it, is to find, and remember now we're talking about a scenario in which the country has lost access to the commercial markets. The second option, if you have it, is to find some official sector source who will lend you the money to continue to repay your maturing debt obligations. This, friends, was Europe starting in 2010 with the sole and belated exception of the Greek debt restructuring in March of 2012, 
Uh, the policy in Europe was for official sector lenders, the EU and the IMF, to lend the afflicted countries, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Cyprus, all the money they needed to continue to repay uh, their maturing bonds. The effect, as, as we'll discuss uh, tomorrow, the effect, of course, was that those liabilities simply migrated out of the hands of the commercial lenders who had lent the money and onto the shoulders of the official sector and their taxpayer-funded uh, 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 sources. But if you don't have a source for official sector lending, there is only one remaining option, and that is to restructure the debt. As Jerome has explained, if there is one constant theme through the sovereign debt crises of the last 40 years, it probably is that countries put off that decision as long as possible. Uh, if you look in the 1980s, for example, uh, when Mexico, which was the flagship restructure, eventually raised the balloon of a debt restructuring in August of 1982, um, I remember uh, uh, the, one of the economists at that time saying to me, the reserves have gone negative. I have no idea what that means, but it sure sounds bad. <laughs> okay, so we're at the point that the balloon has gone up. The first issue, well, actually the first issue is probably going to be, shall we have an IMF program? Um, and there are strong views on this. The IMF will obviously provide a degree of financing, and to that degree they are welcome, but it is never without strings. There's always conditionality, uh, and that conditionality uh, is for the local politician both good news and bad news. It is bad news insofar as uh, the IMF is going to ask for a degree of fiscal adjustment and that is politically unpopular. It is good news insofar as the local politician realizes that they are going to have to implement fiscal adjustment and it's so much easier to blame it on the IMF than it would be to say that we are uh, doing this uh, uh, on our own. From the standpoint of the market, and this is really the point for this seminar. From the standpoint of the commercial lenders, uh, the IMF plays a very important role. Uh, remember that in, in a world of bond finance, you've got thousands, tens of thousands of bondholders. It is fatuous to believe that any significant portion of them are going to be able to study the condition of the Republic of Ruritania and form a view as to whether a debt restructuring is necessary or whether the terms of a debt restructuring are proportional to what Ruritania needs. As Jerome said, what, what the commercial creditor fears is that once having cracked through the crust of incurring the opprobrium of history, in announcing a debt restructuring, once having cracked through that crust, uh, a local politician might say, well, let's bring the sword of the Lord to these creditors, because the more uh, debt relief I extract from the creditors, the less I'm going to have to implement fiscal adjustment at home, and the foreign creditors don't vote, uh, whereas the, 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 the local population does. Uh, that's what they fear, but at base, at base, every sovereign debt restructuring comes down to a burden-sharing decision. How much of the discomfort of the adjustment should be put on the citizens of Ruritania in the form of fiscal adjustment, uh, reduce the public sector workforce, raise taxes, strip, strip off subsidies, cut pensions, this sort of thing, and how much of the burden of the adjustment is to be borne by the creditors in the form of debt relief. That, friends, that is the basic decision. Hmm? We have only one institution that, argue, love it or hate it, 
that arguably has both the political legitimacy to make that decision and the competence to do it, and that is the International Monetary Fund. Hmm? From the standpoint of a commercial creditor invited to join a debt restructuring, the fact that there is a third party that has made that decision, and by the way, they will make it. Uh, they, will not, uh, they will not own up to it, but if you look at an IMF program for a country, it will show a certain amount of money that is available for debt relief. Uh, that, uh, that line item on the program, frankly, defines the fate of of the commercial creditors, uh, the IMF won't tell the country how to do it, but they'll tell them you may not pay more than this amount without breaking the program and returning to, to the very beginning. This, by the way, I have found over the years uh, to be one of the more charming aspects of this business. Uh, when commercial creditors enter a room with a sovereign to negotiate the terms of a debt restructuring, what they often fail to appreciate is that the outcome is largely preordained. Uh, you're really there. No minister of finance could allow himself or herself to be persuaded to pay the commercial creditors more than the IMF has already told them they can pay uh, without risking the entire program. Uh, but as, as in theology, so in sovereign debt restructuring, it is occasionally useful to nurture the illusion of free will. Hmm? <laughs> okay. The first question is, who gets restructured and who doesn't? Here are the general rules. Rule number one. If you're a creditor of a sovereign, your first objective in any discussion is to talk your way out of it. Hmm? That is, your objective will be to persuade the sovereign to put you into a category that will be labeled excluded debt. Hmm? Now, you must have a plausible reason for claiming uh, a preferred creditor status. Uh, here are the usual candidates. At the very top of the list will be the multilateral financial organizations, the International Monetary Fund, uh, traditionally the World Bank and the regional development banks, Asian Development Bank, IDB, that sort of thing. Uh, their excuse is that they are crisis lenders. So they will lend when no one else will. Uh, they therefore will argue that they replicate what in U.S. practice is called debtor in possession financing. That is, when a corporate goes into an insolvency proceeding, by law it can incur new indebtedness, but that new indebtedness will rank at the very top uh, of the waterfall uh, in the event that a liquidation uh, has to occur. And that is the excuse for the multilaterals. Just below the multilaterals, you will have wannabe multilaterals, institutions who will claim some official sector connection. Uh, so in this category, you've got people like the Caribbean Development Bank. You arguably have people like the European Investment Bank. You arguably, and I look around at all my European central banking friends here, uh, have people like ECB. We will talk tomorrow about ECB and Greece. Uh, but uh, in any event, you've got uh, wannabe multilaterals. Below them, uh, you will have groups of creditors who will make the case that the cost-benefit of restructuring them is disproportionately bad for the sovereign. Classic case are trade creditors and suppliers. They will normally be able to either talk themselves out of a debt restructuring or at least get better terms on the argument that uh, the country cannot exist without trade finance. It has become conventional in sovereign debt restructurings to exclude uh, 
short-term government obligations, treasury bills. Why? Because uh, in the immediate aftermath of a debt restructuring, the sovereign's unlikely to be able to access a commercial market. Uh, it will need some source of refinancing, and so it has become perfectly acceptable to exclude uh, treasury bills and that sort of thing. Second general rule. So first general rule is if you can talk your way out of it, talk your way out of it. Second general rule is if you can't talk your way out of it, by God, you must insist that everybody else be also roped into it. Why? Because to a degree, it is a zero-sum game. Mm? Uh, the more creditors who participate in giving debt relief to a sovereign, the less the quantum of debt relief any one of them needs to give. So the moment you realize that you're in the corral, you then shift your objective to persuading the sovereign to put everyone else in the corral with you. And you will scrutinize with considerable skepticism uh, the sovereign's argument that certain types of creditors should be excluded. Classic case, guys, classic case, is when the sovereign says uh, to its uh, international bondholders, well, actually what we'd like to do is uh, not restructure our local bondholders. Hmm? Uh, wholly apart from the fact that they tend to vote, uh, many of those bonds will be held by the local financial uh, institutions and the sovereign will say, force us to restructure those and we will decapitate our banking system. Every dollar we save in debt service we'll have to spend in recapitalizing the banking system. So that's the kind of debate that you have. But if you're in the corral, you will want to vet and question uh, any proposal that, uh, that other people stay out of it. I promise to give you historical examples. The most poignant example of this that I ever encountered was Iraq in 2005. So uh, Saddam Hussein had left at the request of the 4th Infantry Division. Um, among his more grisly legacies was $140 billion of debt that he had run up. He had run it up to an astonishing, a diverse array of creditors, uh, ranging from banks uh, to suppliers of all types, uh, to Japanese and Korean construction companies. Um, and when the debt restructuring began, every one of them made a case for why they should be exempted. Uh, the banks argued that uh, uh, when Iraq finished this process, they would need to borrow again and the banks would be there. Uh, the supplier said, quite literally, I shipped you frozen chickens. Y you let them sit on the dock in Basra in 120 degree weather. I'm not responsible for the fact that the chickens did not find that a gratifying experience, so please pay me. Um, it is hazardous. I would say it is fatal uh, for a sovereign at this par point in the process to allow itself to be persuaded to accord excluded debt status uh, to any particular group of creditors unless there is a general consensus that that group should be exempted, as there is mostly for the multilaterals and as there is for the trade and supplier credits. Secured credits, to the extent they exist, will also be exempted. Why? Because uh, we borrowed to finance you know, the airplane, and the airplane's got a lien over it. If we don't pay that debt, we'll lose the airplane. That's the argument. Um, Lee, where would arbitration award holders sit in this process, typically? 
uh, not <laughs> Dominic in an excluded debt category. Um, so this is Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, uh, over the last 20 years, has had a policy of routinely nationalizing and expropriating foreign multinational investments in the country. It has produced 40-some arbitral cases in front of the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, at the World Bank. Uh, the arbitration awards are being handed down. So these are claims against the Republic. Um, in a debt restructuring, I think it would be difficult to get the bondholders to accept debt relief unless you're also going to do something with that enormous category of liabilities. The bondholders could not, with equanimity, let you uh, uh, exclude <laughs> the arbitration award holders from the debt restructuring uh, or pay them because, as the bondholder will see it, uh, they're simply giving you additional debt relief in order to satisfy another creditor group. And that's the dynamic. That's what I want to bring out here. That is the dynamic of this stage of the discussion. Sovereign debt restructuring is really quite simple. Uh, if you open the toolkit of a sovereign debt restructurer, you will find only three tools. <laughs> we can reduce the principal of the debt, a haircut in the jargon. We can reduce the interest rate on the debt, uh, or we can extend maturities, or we can mix and match any of those three, but that's basically all that the debt restructurer can do. Uh, 